Today's guest is so freaking awesome. Her name is Danny Dame. She goes by Danielle Dame. That's D-A-E-M on the social media. She's a holistic nutrition coach. Um, she specializes in sugar freedom She's in somatic embodiment. So her messages are all about emotional eating and breaking free from sugar um, and regulating your blood sugar. And so she really goes into how she's combined those two, like... <sighs> helping you have a deeper understanding of why you may feel addicted to sugar or overeating, binge eating, like what is actually really going on from both a psychological standpoint and a physiological standpoint, which you know I'm a huge fan of. So we just rolled today that she is so good. She's so well-spoken on this topic. Um, make sure you check out her website. It's danielledame.com if you want to learn more about her programs and her retreats and her podcast and so many things. She's really great. You guys are going to love her. So let's go ahead and get into the show. Here is Danielle Dame. Okay, so Danny, I'm so excited to get into emotional eating, blood sugar, the crossover between those, and probably a lot of people are so hard on themselves because they don't understand that crossover. Um, and then just diving individually into each of those, since this is your bread and butter, what you do. Um, and so before we dive into each of those, will you just share your background and how you got to this place and why you decided to really focus in on emotional eating and blood sugar? Yeah, for sure. Thank you, first of all, for having me on the show. I'm I'm very excited to be here and just to have this conversation. This is something that I'm so deeply passionate about, and it goes even beyond emotional eating, right? And this 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 root cause approach. But uh, I'll keep it as quick as possible. <laughs> my story, really, like for all of us, my relationship with food, my addiction specifically with sugar, really started in childhood and was something that was just a part of my everyday life. I grew up in a normal nuclear family household and sugar was just in everything. It was part of, you know, always had dessert. It was, you know, a snack after every meal. I was a picky eater. I only wanted to eat white pasta and cheese pretty much for years. So it was a lot of like eating issues uh, that started really young. Uh, combined with what I can clearly see now is my mom's addiction to, to sugar. She always had snacks. She was always hiding it. There was a lot of shame. There was a lot of just deep rooted escapism, which mm -hmm. will make sense as we start talking more about the emotional piece mm -hmm. that really started for me at a young age. And where things finally started to shift for me, I can only really look back in hindsight because at the time I didn't know what was happening, but my rock bottom really existed during the two years that I actually worked in the financial industry here in Canada. I worked in, um, in one of the largest banks here in Canada in an office environment that I can say now was completely soul sucking. It sucked all of my life force energy and joy. And I would come home every day, absolutely miserable definitely depressed, anxious, just all of the things that were so heavy. But I thought that I was being successful. I had this high power job. I looked successful. I was making good money. Like this was what I was supposed to be doing. So I kept doing it thinking that, no, oh, this is what I want. But really it was what society wanted of me, right? It was a different definition of success. It was not actually mine. And I was living completely out of alignment with who I was really am and what I actually have to gift here on this planet. So that, that two year period of time, my husband was also miserable. We were both just at rock bottom emotionally. And what I would do is come home and binge on all the things that I could. There was the pizza, the pasta. I would grab a bottle of wine. I would grab Netflix and I would be in the bath. And Sounds that was familiar. Like, anybody? Sounds yeah, familiar? anybody can relate to that. <laughs> no, just me. It was like all the things. It wasn't just sugar, right? It was the wine and the Netflix and any way that I could escape this internal absolute misery that I was experiencing that I didn't really know I was experiencing. I didn't really right. know that there was something different. I was right. like, well, this is just normal. I guess this is just what it's like to get out in the workforce and be in a, in a job um, setting. So I really just lived in this way and the disconnection that created with me and my husband and the challenges with friendships, I was just not a happy person. And yeah. that was really the rock bottom of my emotional eating, my mechanisms for escaping, right? Which is essentially what we're doing when we emotionally eat. We're trying to get the heck out of some very uncomfortable internal yep stuff that's going on. Yeah. And luckily my husband and I, I mean, we got to rock bottom enough where we knew we needed to leave our jobs and we had no idea what was next. So we took that first scary leap of faith and both quit our jobs. And we actually went to travel South America for a year. Wow. And that was the trip wow. that really 
I've always wanted to learn Spanish. So I went, learned some Spanish, traveled, and really started seeing how different cultures relate to food, right? Seeing that different cultures actually cook food. Mm -hmm. What? You go to the market and you actually bring food home. You don't just go to McDonald's. Like what? Mm -hmm. So really started understanding a little, a little bit more about what my relationship with food and how dysfunctional it was. And just the quick convenience foods, the constant snacking, the, like the binging on sugar whenever I can to make me feel better. And that trip really just it, it really shined a light on a lot of areas of my life that were, were missing. Mm. And a lot of really started my inward journey of connecting with myself and my spiritual wow. journey. Mm. So fast forward, coming home from that trip a year later, uh, my husband and I both stepped into the entrepreneurial world. We knew that we had so much more to offer the world and we needed to do it on our terms. And I started getting into through a series of events, it really st- started being curious about health coaching. And that led me to nutrition coaching. And that's when I did my certification as a holistic nutrition coach, which started me in my, my work that I do with my clients. And it is, looks completely nothing like that today. This was seven years ago. I started helping with meal planning and habit building. And now I'm really in the world and passion of helping women uncover the root causes of why they're eating why they're eating, why they're binging, why the addictive Mm -hmm. patternings. I'm really, really fascinated about the root causes of addiction specifically, whether that's with sugar. I mean, that's kind of my MO, my jam, uh, pun intended, (laughs) sugar-free jam. Mm -hmm. And, and really where I, where I just am so passionate about helping women step back into their power and, and uncover their voice and heal their trauma and regulate their nervous system. And as you know, a lot of these pieces that are actually underlying why we don't look after ourselves, right? Why we binge, why we escape. Mm-hmm. And a big part of that root cause is the emotional piece, which I know we're going to get mm-hmm. deep into. So I'll pause there. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. Mm-hmm. Well, that was amazing. Thank you for sharing. And yeah, I always am like, when you have addictions, that's just the symptom. When you have things happening, you're doing things you don't want to be doing. That's the symptom of the problem. That's not the problem. But where we go is stop drinking, stop eating sugar. And it's like, that's not why you're even that's, that's not the issue. It's a symptom. And then I have to give you kudos because I was just having this conversation with someone this morning. Um, when, when life is showing you that you need to shift, it takes so much courage to let go when there's no wrong. Like you're like going across some monkey bars over a cliff. It feels like, and you, and you can't even see the next wrong. And it's like, okay, let go and just jump. And that's what it feels like, you know, and it takes a lot of courage. And I just want to highlight that because if anybody listening is in that boat right now and you just know, you just know in your soul that it's time to let go of the old paradigm in your life. If you will have that courageous leap like that, when you're not exactly sure where the next wrong is, you're not exactly sure where you're going. And obviously in the way that feels in alignment to you, I have never not seen something incredible happen in someone's life like yours and your husband's sense if they were are willing to do that. So got to give you kudos there. Um, okay. So emotional eating and like, oh my gosh, all of us can relate to this. So my, I was you, I bet like most of the people listening have been you and that, that whole scenario of the frozen pizza or the fast food or the, you know, sugary stuff all the time and the movie. And you don't even, you didn't even know, or maybe someone listening right now, like if you would have asked me back then, I wouldn't have been like, yeah, I'm really miserable in my life. I'd have been like, no, I'm good. I'm good. You know? <laughs> yeah. And so let's get into this. The, the, some of the big reasons that you're seeing the underlying root causes that you're seeing that are leading to these types of behaviors and yeah. whatever way they're manifesting food, TV, escapism stuff. What are some big hitters that you see all the time? Why do we escape, right? Why the need to get the heck out of feeling uncomfortable? So yeah, this is a big topic and a big question. Right. So I'll try to keep it simple as you know, <laughs> right? This is all really at the bottom is this dysregulation of not feeling safe in our body. And Mm. we all have this. This is a Mm. byproduct of the world that we live in, the households that we grew up in, the lack of emotional validation, ability to actually be ourselves as children, the control Mm. that we all have a different flavor depending on who your parents were and how they, how they supported you or didn't support you with emotions. But in general, when we think of our emotional being, right, first of all, 
we are emotional beings. We're meant to feel emotions. It's part of a healthy human experience. We're sentient beings. We're meant to feel joy and grief. Like there, that's not one or the other, it's both, but we live in a world that we have been taught that's not okay. So whether that was emotions never being acknowledged in your household or you being pulled away from connection and love as a child when you were having a temper tantrum, right? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes we're sent to the room, right? You're sent Mm -hmm. away. And in that disconnection and all of these experiences, we learn that it's not okay to feel emotions, right? And Mm -hmm. it's not okay to express them. If Mm -hmm. I express my emotions, mom gets mad, right? Or it, it, the teacher gets mad at me if I cry, or I'm told that I'm too sensitive, right? All the messaging that we get is, is stifling our emotions, right? Every angle and not to put definitely no blaming on like, this is a systemic issue. This isn't your parents' fault, you know, but we are just now understanding the emotional needs of children in, in Mm -hmm. being properly validated and held Mm -hmm. space for, as opposed to being shut down. Mm -hmm. And we have learned most of us in our nervous systems that it's not safe to number one, express emotions, but more importantly, even feel the emotion. Right. So what we've done as a coping mechanism from a very young age in order to get the love and acceptance that we needed from our caregivers is to stuff those emotions down, to put on a brave face, to pretend I'm okay, right? Everything's okay. Don't rock the boat, right? Children are meant to be like seen and not heard. Like whatever messaging you got Mm -hmm. in your household, it's all at the root, this, this imprint in your, your nervous system. And then in your neural pathways that it's not safe to feel and it's actually bad to feel, or I'm a bad person if I cry or if I'm angry, especially, you know, for any women listening, this is one that we're not allowed to apparently feel angry, which actually makes me angry that that's a belief that we have, right? I'm angry about not being allowed to be angry um, because of the work that I've done. But these is right. just a really quick overview of how we have been stifled in our emotional expression and how that stifling has actually put these protectors and these walls up in our actual body. So this is beyond willpower of the mind. This yep. is the somatic understanding that our nervous system runs everything and our emotional stuffing down of our emotions our whole lives is actually accumulated as toxic energy in our cells and research and science. I know Gabor Mate talks a lot about this now and really understanding that the pushing down of our authentic expression of emotions is actually leading to physical disease. So this is beyond just a conversation of like not emotional eating, but this is an actual deep conversation of when Mm -hmm. we do not validate and honor and feel and process our emotions in a healthy way, they will come out either as binge eating, emotional eating, addiction, or disease, right? Whether it's MS, obesity, weight gain, right? This is like a huge area that I'm really passionate about, especially in the like, weight resistance, weight loss resistance conversation that people right. don't think about the, the actual message that our body is having. If we're not feeling safe, right. Mm-hmm. We're holding on to fat to stay alive. Right. So there's, I mean, that's a whole tangent for another mm-hmm. day, but mm-hmm. that's mm-hmm. kind of the, the quick overview of like what's going on and just understanding we have no frame of reference for even how to feel. Most right. of us were not right. held in a space to learn that it's safe to be sad or it's safe to be depressed or it's safe to be angry. And how do we actually work with that emotion instead of avoiding it and escaping it, right? Which is our pattern. Now our pattern is I have no idea how to feel the weight of this grief. So I'm going to do everything I can to escape or the weight Mm -hmm. of this stress or, or anger at work or, you know, all the things that I was feeling in my job, I didn't have any reference for how do I handle this? Like, how do I actually feel safe and, and process these emotions? I have no mm-hmm. reference. This is not something we've ever been taught and I'm just going to escape, right? I'm going mm-hmm. to binge eat or do drugs or drink alcohol or shop, right? Any of these addictive mm-hmm. tendencies are, are stemming from that place. Mm-hmm. You know, you're making me think when, you know, the song when we were little kids, that was like, if you're happy, you know, it, clap your hands. Yes. If you're mad and you know, it, stomp your feet. If you're sad and you know, it, say boohoo. I kid you not that when my daughter who was now 17, when she was little and I would have all these little nursery rhyme song CDs that I would play in the car, they only ever had happy. Every single verse was happy. Yeah. And yeah. I was like, Hey, wow. you know what? When I was little, it used to be angry and sad and like, it's okay to feel those things too, you know? And so you think about that in terms of like what so many of us 
received. Yes, we received rejection, anger, dismissal, like the abandonment, the complete lack of love. If you experience anything that isn't quote unquote happy, joyous. And so, yeah, deep in our, deep in our bodies, it's, there's, that is the most dangerous way I can feel. That is, I should not ever feel any of those things. And I don't know about you, but when I was in the phase of, you know, binge eating and all of the things you're talking about, I, I had no idea what I was feeling. I, yeah, no idea. Like you're talking about. And so I'm assuming, you know, I'm kind of without, you know, obviously you have courses and programs and this is what you do for a living, but just a little basis, you know, where does somebody start that maybe is just hearing this podcast episode and they're like, okay, yeah, that all sounds really familiar. Where do they start to, to even get into an open place to start dealing with these things in a safe and effective way? Yeah, for sure. Um, so yes, that's such a good question. I want to preface <laughs> before I answer it specifically, I want to mention that my approach and what I've really seen, especially when we start navigate into um, opening up emotionally again, there's kind of two phases that that I like to highlight that are really important. And it's very easy for a lot of people to slip right into phase two, which is why I just want to kind of highlight this when we are wanting to break these these, this dysregulation of allowing ourselves to feel and break the, the paradigm and the narrative, Mm -hmm. the old bullshit. I hope I can say that here, right? Uh, The belief (laughs) systems and the, the shit that's no longer serving us, the stuff that Mm -hmm. we've, we've, we're needing to unlearn. Mm -hmm. The first step is, as we've talked about is learning to feel. And this (laughs) sounds really strange, but like you just mentioned it and myself as well, there was this, I don't even know what I'm feeling. Right. I don't even know what I need. I'm so disconnected from my body because I live my whole life in my head because that's where it's safe, where I can control Mm -hmm. things again, safety mechanisms. Right. So the phase one that is really important is actually learning how to feel again. And not only that, but learning how to know that you're safe while you're feeling the heavy stuff. So this is where like nervous system regulation and learning how to be in, I'm using grief as an example, because it's a very intense, very painful emotion that I know very, very well. Mm. Um, and like actually be in the grief and feel the pain, but know that I'm safe Mm -hmm. and not just know it mentally, but my body knows it. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the work that is ultimately the hardest Mm -hmm. is repatterning these old pathways of it's not good to feel this emotion Mm -hmm. or I'm bad or I'm broken. There's something mm-hmm. wrong with me. Why am I not happy all the time? Because like mm-hmm. you mentioned, that is the message that we get, right. right? You should be happy all the time or there's something wrong with you. And I'm like, wait right. a second, there's something wrong with you if you're happy all the time. Right. Red <laughs> Definitely. Red flag. But, um, you know, really just diving into that, learning how to feel, right? Making friends with your feelings, learning that you're safe to feel what needs to be felt. And then phase two, only after you have begun getting a good foundation of phase one, do you move on to phase two, which is processing the energy of those emotions. So when there are big things going on, yes, there is a lot of tools, especially somatic based experiences and tools that we can use and should use to move Mm -hmm. that energy out of our body, Mm -hmm. right? So the anger Mm -hmm. that's present, right? To have a good scream or go Mm -hmm. boxing. You know, I know know you spend Mm -hmm. a lot of time in the gym, right? And a lot Mm -hmm. of your listeners do too. So go physical workout, right? Like do something really intense. So, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a lot of tools that we can use then to move that energy out. So the anger Mm -hmm. is no longer stuffed in, right? We're Mm -hmm. actually pushing it out of our being, releasing it, right? And we can do, you know, there's a million techniques that we can use with different emotions, but that is phase two. Mm -hmm. And that's the piece that people really, really get stuck in very quickly is to go from, well, emotional eating. I just need to distract myself with something healthy, right? So I'm going to go for a run or I'm going to go and listen to a podcast or I'm going to go and like maybe do something nourishing, but you're still distracting. You're still escaping. You're still perpetuating. It's not safe to sit in this emotion. Does that make sense? Yep. Oh yeah. 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 Uh, okay. A few things. One, um, (laughs) I've definitely gone on the full spectrum of like the positive person. Um, and I, I actually find a lot of endurance athletes fall into this hardcore because when you are out on a hundred mile bike ride or a triathlon, or in my experience, a 26 mile marathon and you're dehydrated and everything hurts and you're terrified and you're just like, I might pass out on this course. The only option you have to finish that athletic event is fake positive. 
right? You got this. You're doing great. You're doing awesome. You got this. It's, so, it's just a mile. It's just a mile. So easy. So easy. You, you know, you literally like build this pattern in of being false positive in order to complete an athletic event. And so I realized early on, I'm like, wow, that is really pattern. I'm going to have to unlearn that. I'm going to have to unlearn to like in my life to not utilize that a lot, you know, every once in a while, sure. In an acute moment to just get through something. Sure. But throughout your daily life, really dangerous. And, um, I'll have to connect to you if you haven't had him on your show yet. Uh, Dr. Alex Wills, he wrote a book called give a fuck. Actually it's his counter argument to the subtle art of not giving a fuck, which I like the, the book, that book too, but like, Oh man, he just has such a great, and what he teaches is radical emotional acceptance. So like a little playoff radical acceptance. And, um, I'm just sharing as it, because I think it's pertinent to this conversation after interviewing him, reading his book, I personally, started practicing just when I usually do it when I'm driving, but I'll do it anytime. Like even just, you know, during a podcast or on a coaching, what am I feeling right now? But it's, you know, it's nice if you have some moment and I'm, I'm just, you're driving along. I can't recommend it enough. Like just when you're driving around somewhere, just what am I feeling? Get to know what your body feels like with different emotions. Cause it will be like, you might start with mm, bored. Okay. Yeah. What else? What else? What else are you feeling right now? You know, it's kind of sad. Okay. And just get to know what that feeling feels like in your body. Right. And then it's like, it can start to get that awareness up. So you, you get so familiar with the somatic feeling that you can start to identify those emotions better. So just throwing that out and as a quick, easy yeah. thing, you know, that has really helped me in terms of being able to get used to it's like, okay, feel sad. We're not going to sit here and try to figure it out and blah, 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 and not be sad anymore. We're just going to see how long you feel sad about that thing that happened three days ago. Oh, still sad about that. Still yeah. sad about that. And like, kind of let it run its course. Like a fever has been really beneficial for me. And I love your, I love that you are hitting on not suppressing through healthy cover-ups. Oh, it's easy to do. How many of you guys needed to hear that? So good. (laughs) Mic drop. Yeah. Let me, let me quickly add to that. I love what you just said, because that's, that's really powerful is, and that's where I was going to share and actually answering your question. You asked me earlier is where do we start Mm. right in starting to create some space in your day to actually feel right. And even ask those questions because we've never given ourselves the space. We're busy. We've got too much going on, but I want to add to anybody out there who's listening, who is, who has really strong protectors who has really strong disassociation from the body, maybe Mm -hmm. validly from traumatic Mm -hmm. events, right? Mm -hmm. We disassociate. Mm -hmm. Um, So navigating back into actually feeling, which is phase one, step one can be tricky. And for many, they might not even be able to identify boredom or sadness while you're driving. Right. So a really great place to start before that is even just tuning into sensations in the body. Nice. So before even having to label emotions, I know a lot of my clients really struggling labeling emotions. Like I have no idea what sadness feels like or happiness. Right. Totally. So even just starting with that, like, Ooh, I'm feeling some tension in my jaw. Right. Mm -hmm. Or I'm noticing that my brow is furrowed or that I've got a pain in my hip, right? Mm. Even just notice, starting to notice, mm. oh, I've got a knot in my stomach, right? And mm. paying attention to pains or sensations in the body, even before that, if you can't even do that, mm. is even just starting to notice like what your body feels like when you touch something. Like, nice. what does this mug nice. feel like in my hands, right? Like, can I feel this mug, the ceramic against my fingers? Can I feel Excellent. the the floor below my feet here as I'm talking to you? Right. So there's a lot of tools like that even come before that so for good. anybody who, who might be blocked. And that's a really, really right. great place to start. Right. Mm. But we have to create space for that. Like you just yeah. said, and to answer yeah. that question about where people can start is to do just that. So whether that's a morning practice or when you're, every time you're driving, right. Or like having those checkpoints throughout the day for you to actually get curious about what's going on below the head, right. Mm-hmm. For what's going on below here, what's happening with your breath. Are you holding your breath? Um, the breath is a really good indicator of sort of what's going on in our nervous system as well. Mm-hmm. And, a, and a great mm-hmm. tool to kind of check in with our body. Mm-hmm. Um, so that I would say for anybody who's like, not sure where to start with this is to start there, start with so that good. awareness, start so with connecting good. with the body mm-hmm. and then graduating maybe to another, a really, really powerful practice is, or combining this is checking in specifically before you eat anything. Putting yeah. anything in your mouth, That's right? what like I was water, ask. wine, right where I wanted coffee, to go. right? Yay. Like what is going on nice. in your life, in your body, yes. 
right? Yes. In your mind, what thoughts are there? Are you being like really mean to yourself in your brain? And that's oh. why you're holding a tub of ice cream, like mm -hmm. starting to curiously without judgment, be yeah. that investigator of like, what's going on, getting your baseline here so you can understand yourself better. Mm -hmm. And then from there, you know, you can take all sorts of steps to, to start shifting that, but it starts Beautiful. with that, the baseline. Yeah. Getting that awareness. And that, that really like, I, as I was trickling out of emotional eating, what you just said there was what finally got me to address those last lingering issues that would cause it. Right. And so just that simple awareness of, okay, that's interesting. And, and noticing patterns too, like I'll be vulnerable. It was, you know, or kind of early in my post-divorce dating life thing. I would notice that after some dates, I would start emotionally eating and after others, I wouldn't. And I was like, okay, I'm just going to watch this. Like what is going on here? And I just noticed, I'm like, when I didn't feel safe, when I felt like the guy was kind of like creepy or like, or like there was some sort of energy that I didn't feel safe around, I would go emotionally. And so then I started, it actually really transformed my dating life and what I said yes to and showing up for myself and speaking my voice and all of that simply by noticing like, wow, so you, you didn't like being around that person, but you didn't speak your voice. You didn't set boundaries. You just kind of like endured it. And now you're emotionally eating to like, as a, you know, to boost your mood because that was so brutal for you. How about what if you just spoke your truth? Well, how about what if you just said no? And then like, maybe you don't need to feel better after, you know? So it like that practice you're sharing, like can really radically transform your life just by becoming aware of what is going on inside of me before I go to eat this or that. Yeah, yeah. Super great. Yeah. Well, this is, this is a, a, an example of an, I love that example because what we're doing there is stepping into our power, mm -hmm. right? Like ladies, mm -hmm. this is it. When we, when we take back our gifts, especially as women being mm -hmm. feelers, right. And, mm -hmm. and learning how to honor what our body is telling us, right? Like your body was sending you strong messages of, I'm not getting a good vibe about this dude. Right. Right. But you did it anyway, because you should, or because right. you don't, don't want to be alone or in the, 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 all the right. people, all excuses, stuff. right. 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 <laughs> you went against and Every time we go against what our inner voice is saying, right. We break trust with ourselves. And this is mm -hmm. a big part of the work that I do with my clients is mm -hmm. as we navigate back into the body, we get to relearn how to trust ourselves mm -hmm. and trust like that we have all the answers within as well. I know this is a big, you know, trap that we all fall into is looking everywhere outside of ourselves for the answers. And that might even be this podcast. Maybe you're showing up today, listening to this going, oh, I hope that this Danielle Dame chick has all the answers for me. And I don't, right? This is like you taking your power back mm -hmm. to understand that you have all of this within your body knows mm -hmm. what you need. It knows who you should date and who you shouldn't date and what job mm -hmm. you should take and mm -hmm. what next step you should take in your business. You know, mm -hmm. all these things are already within you. And mm -hmm. we need to stop outsourcing our health, our decisions to all these authority figures who apparently know yeah. us better. And it's, it's such BS. Oh yeah. I was like, at this point in time, if you've hired a coach or mentor of some sort and they're not turning you back inside of yourself, I would really start to think about that, you know, because yeah. And you're right. It is a huge problem. Like the, the guru mentality, this powerless, oh. I don't know anything. And I just need somebody yeah. to tell me what to do. You know, I've even had clients ask me to tell them what to do hour by hour. And I'm like, nope, nope, yeah. nope. Nope. No, that's not gonna work. <laughs> yeah. We gotta, we gotta go deeper than that, yeah. you know, much love. Right. But, yeah. um, okay. All right. So kind of summing up emotional eating is, you know, understanding first that you are dysregulated when this is happening mm -hmm. and there's varying levels of most likely how traumatized you were in childhood you could be so disassociated from your body that like just sitting there and trying to be like, what am I feeling right now? is like not going to happen. Right. So kind of, it sounds like you, you know, you have different approaches for how deep that is, but in general, um, being able to become more aware of what's happening inside of you when you're going to emotionally eat is kind of what the gist that I'm getting. Correct. Yeah. For sure. Through yeah. a, you know, more specific journey, which I'm sure you take people through. Okay. Um, let's, let's transition over to blood sugar a little bit. So where, why blood sugar in this whole game? Where does this come in? Well, I mean, yeah, this is, this is a fascinating switch. And I know you've had my, my dear friend and our, our colleague, Danielle Hamilton on the show as well, who's the absolute expert in blood sugar stuff. So definitely check that episode out. Um, but yeah, this is, this is definitely, um, a huge part in looping into almost perpetuating, 
the emotional energetic sensations that are happening in our body, right? We know now that when our blood sugar is dysregulated from years of just eating crap, um, and it doesn't even have to be years. I mean, you could have had a binge last night and your blood sugar is going to be all over the place. It's going to affect your sleep. I mean, there's a lot of, mm-hmm. a, a lot of issues now that I'm sure I don't have to go over at, at this point, but is really also this massive trigger into what's going on emotionally and energetically. These are all looped together. You know, I know mm-hmm. when I've had a sugar crash or mm-hmm. even a sugar high, right. My mm-hmm. mental state and my emotional state are very much tied into that. Right. Yeah. So that blood sugar crash, right. When we're on that roller coaster all day long can leave us feeling depressed, leave us yeah. feeling anxious, leave us uh-huh. feeling exhausted. Yeah. Right. And really just dysregulated, but on a physical level, right. With our actual yeah. blood sugar roller coasting that. So when our nervous system's dysregulated and then our blood sugar is dysregulated, <laughs> yeah. we're just like in caught in this loop, right? right? Caught in this cycle of need more sugar, right? Mm-hmm. So we're kind of being hit with a double-edged sword and why I personally think sugar and especially sugar addiction is one of the hardest things to overcome is because not only is it ingrained in our bodies psychologically as, as a coping mechanism and as a tool, everything we talked about, but it's also just being so fed into all of our foods and so deeply ingrained in the way that we eat, right. The way that we live our lives. And we're having this very physical addictive reaction, obviously spiking our dopamine centers and hijacking our brain in the way that most addictive substances do giving us that temporary, you know, sense Mm -hmm. of, of happiness. That's not real um, Mm -hmm. or lasting. And And really just, yeah, continuing this, this, this detrimental cycle. So Mm -hmm. when it comes to like our blood sugars, understanding that there's a lot of work there to do. Right. Mm -hmm. And, Mm -hmm. you know, there's, there's no one way to, to do that, but it's just this process as we go into getting the crap out of our life, the processed foods, right. Getting these things out, we can help our body by learning to actually have balanced blood sugar. Right. And, and there's a lot of different techniques and tools to this. Like I said, my, my colleague, Danielle Hamilton is definitely the expert in that area (laughs) more so than me, but she, um, you know, this, this understanding that when we can get our actual physical body on board with being more level, even keeled, right. Mm -hmm. Less energy spikes and crashes and all the brain fog and the, all the things that happen when we do have blood sugar dysregulation, it opens up more space for us to actually be present and aware with what's going on under the surface. Mm. A lot of us have this, like, we're kind of in this numb uh, sugar cloud, right? Because it's been in our life. We're just, it's in our everyday. It's breakfast, lunch, dinner, coffees. We're kind of just amped up and, and obviously amping up our nervous system in that, right? That we don't actually have the space physically to analyze what's underneath. Mm -hmm. So we do have to get our blood sugar regulated, get the crap out of our diet in order for us to really take a look at where that, where the deeper levels of coping mechanism might be showing up. Does that Mm -hmm. make sense? Oh, big time. And I love your approach because anybody who's trapped in this emotional eating cycle, they're so hard on themselves. So, and I was too, right? Like I would just like eat all the things. And then I would wake up the next day, like, Oh, like this, the deep, you know, maybe not fully conscious thoughts, but the subconscious thoughts were like, what is wrong with you? Why did you do that? I can't believe you did that again. Like just this horrible self-abusive self-talk that was going on. It's just like in my body, just this feeling of like, you suck, you're weak, you can't do it. You something's wrong with you. And it's so unfair. Like what I hope that people are hearing in your messaging, this deep undertone of compassion, because when you are trapped and not ha- understanding what is going on with you and let's say your blood sugar is dysregulated on too. Good luck with that. Good luck. Like, I don't think I would make it either. I, I, none of us, no human being, if you don't understand what's happening with you emotionally and your blood sugar is dysregulated, that is just how it is going to be. You are going to be trapped in those spirals. So I think it's genius that you have combined these two together because you're really hitting, you know, I also am really big on let's hit the physiological and the psychological. That's why I do health and mindset. And in terms of emotional eating, like you're like, we've got to hit the physiological and we got to hit the psychological in order to have a full holistic approach to this. So really smart. 
hundred percent. Yeah. And I actually, I have a three pillar approach with that. I use Mm -hmm. in my programs is exactly that. It's this deep inner work, understanding the root Mm -hmm. causes our foundational pieces, which is the emotional eating, other traumas, you know, a lot of, you know, values, beliefs, who we are, identity stuff, a lot of deep stuff. And then the detox, like the actual physical component of getting our blood sugar re-regulated, getting the junk out of our diet. So we have to address the physical piece and then community. So this is a huge, Mm -hmm. important pillar. If anybody actually wants to create lasting, Mm -hmm. uh, healthy relationship with food, right. Mm -hmm. And with themselves, right. We have Mm -hmm. to have community Mm -hmm. and I, hopefully by now all your listeners are aware of what that, what that means and what that is, but that is absolutely a mandatory pillar with, especially with something as difficult as sugar, right. This is something that is just, we're bombarded with, and you are the, the black sheep in society. If you don't have sugar, right. If you're, you're the weird one at the birthday party, not having cake, like that can trigger all of those old wounds of people pleasing and f- fear of being ostracized from community and just a lot of, you know, acceptance, a lot of things can come up from that. Right. Mm-hmm. So having the tools to deal with that and especially the emotional tools to handle that, like that uncertainty perhaps, mm-hmm. right. Or that, um, disconnection, you know, that you might feel in a community if, if you're not eating cake, right. While everybody else right. is. Or like in your marriage, you know, maybe your partner is like, this is so stupid. Stop doing it. You know, that's tough. If you're all alone, you have no support network. You're just all alone. It's it's very tough. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious what your thoughts are on like no sugar. When someone's like, I'm never eating sugar again, no sugar challenge, no sugar October. You know, what are your thoughts on that approach? Oh my goodness. Such a, such a good question. I have a love hate (laughs) relationship with, with those things because I see them, what I've seen in my practice over the last seven years is it's such a band-aid for most Mm -hmm. people. Mm -hmm. For some people, it can be with an action plan to continue that work. It can be a very important part of the journey, but I see we so easily get caught up in this belief that all I need to do is avoid sugar for 30 days and all my problems will be fixed. (laughs) Right. So many people, and I did this, I can't tell you how many times Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, it's sugar-free week. And then I would be right back in the roller coaster because I did none of the inner work, right? None of this emotional stuff, none of the trauma healing that we've talked about. So brute force. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. yeah, it depends on what your intention mm-hmm. is going into it and what your mm-hmm. expectations of that 14 day or 30 day challenge is, mm-hmm. right? And like, are you going in as like, this is the start of my journey and I'm going to use this space now that my crutch and my best friend is not an option to actually look inward and do the emotional work and be in the discomfort of, well, it's, it's late at night and I'm lonely, but I can't eat anything and, and actually do that self-reflection work and start your inner healing journey. Then mm-hmm. it can be a fantastic tool. But mm-hmm. I think most people listening, I'm going to call you out on this, are are using it as this Hail Mary of this is going to solve all my problems. Mm-hmm. And I think that's one of the biggest, biggest mistakes that I see most women making. We get caught up in this diet mentality. We get caught up in like, all I need to do is willpower myself for 30 days mm-hmm. and all my problems will be gone. Mm-hmm. And the tough love here is that this journey with healing our relationship with food is not something that you will ever heal in 30 days. This is an mm-hmm. ongoing journey. I'm still on my inner healing journey and I still have bouts of time where I'm not eating healthy or I'm in bad mm-hmm. patterns when things are going wrong. And now I know how to not guilt or shame myself through that. Mm-hmm. I know how to actually take the lessons out of that and have compassion mm-hmm. And trust that my body can deal with those toxins, right? That I'm healthy mm-hmm. 90% of the time, my body can handle, you know, the occasional crap that that gets there. So mm-hmm. like, again, that's for me, that's the freedom part, you know, the sugar freedom that I always talk about and that compassion of like not necessarily needing to be in perfectionism mode. Mm-hmm. Um, for me, that's, mm-hmm. that's mentally more damaging because when I'm told oh, yeah. I can't have something, then I want it twice oh, as much, yeah. right? And then I feel deprived. So there's like, mm-hmm. can we learn to work with, um, you know, within boundaries and setting loving Mm -hmm. boundaries for ourselves and, and showing up for ourselves in a way that feels authentic without, you know, getting sucked into Mm self-sabotage. And I don't know if you agree on this approach, but what I found, you know, working with people from like, let's say someone has SIBO or they have certain food sensitivities that they've really never addressed. And they're finally trying to get off gluten or dairy and they've been eating all the gluten and dairy, or they've been eating all the sugar and they found out they have candida and they're just feeling like, so restricted and like, sorry for themselves. And like, I, why can't I just be a normal person? I'm at this party and everybody else gets to eat quote unquote normal. And I don't, and like all of that stuff, which I completely understand. 
Um, my, my personal approach with that and coaching is to have them start really being proactive about things that they love eating, love eating that aren't, that don't include those ingredients. Right. And like really going on a discovery journey of like, okay, do I, you know what I found out you can saute up some apples and some stevia syrup and put some cinnamon on there. And you put that on Greek yogurt. It is so freaking good. And I don't even miss gluten and sugar, you know, like, and so, because if you have those clutch things, I found that that really helps. I'm curious, you're, yeah. you know, and do you have any tips for people that like, cause I know a lot of people when they hear, you know, getting rid of sugar, they, it's just immediately, it's all deprivation mindset. So right. do you have any insights yeah. for people with that, in, that kind of mindset around it? For sure. And that's, that's such an important point because most of us have that. I, I, I had that as well. Right. And that's, you know, really, first of all, is understanding why removing sugar or gluten or dairy feels like a deprivation. What have, what have you been attached? What meaning have you been attaching to that thing? Why is it mm. so important to you mm. that the loss of it feels like everything? And I know specifically for a lot of my clients, sugar is the only source of joy in their life. And mm. sugar is their best friend. That is the only person they have. That's always there for them. It's not a person, but a thing that's there for them. So right. like starting to understand some of the deeper levels of why, first wow. of all, is that su nice. is, are you so attached, right? There's a codependent relationship big time, mm -hmm. right? And maybe you've put all your joy into that one thing, right? And that mm -hmm. in itself is, is a tough pill to swallow and is really mm -hmm. hard to kind of come to terms with, but is is very important. Right. And, and absolutely. I, I agree with what you, what you share is focusing on the kind of focusing on the good, like what can I still have? And I think this is one of the most powerful tools in using our language to support ourselves. Mm -hmm. I often really encourage my clients with this too, is it's not, I can't eat sugar. It's I'm choosing to eat sugar because, or not eat sugar because I love myself. Right. Or I'm choosing right. to not eat gluten because it feels like crap in my body. And I don't want to feel that way. Right. I don't so, want to feel like crap. <laughs> yeah. I actually want to feel great and right. gluten doesn't feel great. So like changing our language and mindset around understanding that these are actually loving choices for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Again, this is helping us step into our power. When we say things like, oh, I can't eat dairy, poor me, right? We're playing victim. We're playing uh -huh. total victim to our circumstances as opposed to really also loving and trusting our body. So when there are intolerances, right? When there are diseases and symptoms of our body, these are actually gifts from our body telling us that something needs to change. These are messages from our body saying, hey, listen up, something mm -hmm. needs to change. Something's out of alignment, whether it's food or there's some trauma that you need to deal with, which can manifest as physical diseases, you know, and there's some healing here to do. And that is mm -hmm. often, even though it doesn't feel like it for people who are really, really struggling, really in it, you know, maybe autoimmune diseases and really struggling mm -hmm. with things. This is your body yelling at you, right? And I want people to start seeing that as a beautiful gift in this message that your body is trying to help you heal, right? Mm -hmm. It's not trying to hate you by making you, you know, mm -hmm. lactose intolerant, right? right? It's not like, oh, I'm just going to I'm going right. to you know, jab you one and yeah. make you, you know, make you celiac and make you Ew. want to. Yeah. Right. yeah. And I think we have that, mm -hmm. that experience because of the way that we see our body is mm -hmm. that it's working against us mm -hmm. and that's not true. So when we fully understand and learn to love that our body is actually working for us, it's trying to help us. It's wants to be healthy. It wants yes. to be happy. It wants to feel good. It wants yes. to operate correctly. And yes. it's trying to get our attention that maybe things need to change. So mm -hmm. maybe bringing in some gratitude as well in that of, I know that that's going to sound hard for some of you who are like, no, but I want gluten. How can I be grateful that I can't eat gluten? Right. Mm -hmm. But it's this understanding that maybe, maybe that is a gift. Maybe mm -hmm. that is actually a really important healing journey that you're meant to go on. That's going to help you uncover some deeper levels and help you mm -hmm. maybe live life more fully. Right. Mm -hmm. And maybe break some codependent bonds that you have with bread, right. Or whatever mm -hmm. that might be. And really start looking at some of those, those deeper pieces. So mm -hmm. that would be a couple of things that I would. Yeah. I would love add. those. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. And you have, so guys, her website is Danielle. Is it Dame? I forgot to ask Dame. you. you yeah. Nailed Dame. It. Okay. Dame. So, um, D A E M Danielle Dame.com. And then you have on there, your break free from sugar program. You have an emotional eating program. You've got your community, you've got your podcast and all of that. Um, and you also have a sugar freedom retreat. It looks like you got a wait list for your next one. So check out her website guys. Um, and yeah, do those, can people start on those programs at any time? 
Great question. So most of my programs are hosted live. I am working on a few DIY options that I do have. So please feel free to reach out to me. They're not on my website, but I do have a couple, couple places that you can get started right away. If you want to dive in actually on my website, I have a great free three-part series for emotional eating. That would be the best place to start. Okay. Um, and then my programs, because of the work that we do, I've learned very importantly, we need to be in live community as we do it. So it's a very, nice. very intentional live experience. And my next Break Free from Sugar program will be in January uh, 2024. And then hopefully in the spring, my next retreat. Yeah, I I hosted my first one this year and it was just mind blowing. So I'm excited Uh, to get more into the in-person. We need more in-person stuff, which is yes. Yes. And and then your um, social media handles are are Danielle Dame or yeah, Danielle Dame coaching on Facebook, Danielle Dame. And then also my podcast Beyond Sugar Freedom as well, which you're going to come on soon. I'm so excited to have you on the show. Okay. Awesome. We will link all of those guys. Go check them out. I am so happy that you came into your purpose and you're doing this. You can tell you are made for it. It's like good work. And wow. I'm just, I'm so impressed and I'm so glad that Danny Hamilton connected us. Thank you, Danny. His, this yeah, is just like <laughs> so awesome. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me on and for everything that you're doing as well, Tara. It's Thanks. just incredible. And thank you everybody for listening. I hope you got something out of it and I hope to, to chat more soon. Thanks. Bye, guys.